may he protect us, may he sustain us, may we grow in strength together, may our study together be fruitful, and may we not hate one another, in these, these days. Well, good morning, <coughs> welcome to the service. Uh, beginning September 1st, we begun our celebrations of Swami Vivekananda's 150th birth anniversary, and so every Sunday in September we have different Swami's coming speaking about different aspects of Swami Vivekananda. So September 1st we had Swami Kripamayananda from Toronto was here. He spoke on the advent of a yogi. Next Sunday Swami Ishatmananda spoke on the making of Swami Vivekananda. Last Sunday we had uh, Pravashika Sevarpana from Hollywood and she spoke on the monk transformed into a missionary. So there have been numerous programs going on. We had last weekend, we had uh, a big program at the Bengali Association of <coughs> India and other, many other programs are going on. You know, I just mentioned this week on Tuesday, we're having a special music concert with Swami Atma Vidyananda that he's composed the Vivekananda Oratorio 150. And so he'll, that'll be performed here on Tuesday at 7.30 p.m. Now today though, I'm very happy to uh, introduce <coughs> Swami Tattva Mayananda, who will speak on Swami Vivekananda as the harbinger of spiritual in India. And Swami Tattva Mayananda, he's the assistant minister at the Vedanta Society of Northern California in San Francisco. And uh, he's been here before and um, he studies scriptures since he was three years old. You know, so he, he's a very, very highly qualified. And I remember the first retreat uh, we had f with him at Ganges, right after the feet, I was just mobbed by people who wanted me to bring him back. And so we're happy to have him back with us again. He's a very knowledgeable, very capable person and very, uh, very good speaker. So I invite Swami Tatvamayananda to speak. My pronouns to Swami Vakadananda Ji, who kindly introduced me to you all. My pronouns to Ichatmananda Ji uh, and other friends who have assembled here. It's a very interesting and perhaps academically a bit stimulating topic, Swami Vivekananda, the harbing of spiritual India. <coughs> After 150 years of Swamiji's Chicago address, when we look back, we can see a huge drama unfolding right from the moment when Swamiji stepped on the podium in September 11, 19, 1893, to address the Parliament of Religion, which was held as part of the 450th, 400th anniversary of Columbus' discovery of India. <coughs> A very interesting event. Yesterday I was quoting something, that's what comes to my mind right now, in yesterday's talk in the evening. When Swami Vivekananda returned to India in 1897, after his long campaign uh, of Vedanta preaching in the Western world, he gave a very interesting talk in the floral hall in Colombo, the capital of what is now Sri Lanka. There he makes a very interesting uh, remark about the uh, 
antiquity and continuity of India's spiritual tradition. These are two important and unique criteria according to Toy and B. Antiquity and continuity. Antiquity can be claimed by the ancient Babylonian, Assyrian, Mayan, Incan, Chinese, Greek, Roman civilizations. But continuity and antiquity together constitute a unique characteristic of an ancient civilization. In fact, that is the uniqueness of India's spiritual tradition. It is the most antique, most ancient. Swamiji himself says, long before the wrong was conceived of, long before the Greek civilization was thought of, India's spiritual culture reached its zenith of its evolution. Swamiji makes a statement. That is true, historically speaking. India's spiritual culture had reached the zenith of its evolution long before Babylon, Assyria, Greece, Rome or Egypt were ever conceived of. Mayan, Incan and Aztec civilizations, they are comparatively young and not so very ancient. Now, if you want to study about the pyramids, how the ancient Egyptians constructed the huge pyramid, I mean pyramid constructions, how they developed the technology to mummify and preserve the dead bodies, Ramses the second, Ramses the first, or any of the ancient Egyptian pharaohs. You have no way to know. You have to go to some libraries, historical museums, archival centers, or you can go to Egypt, you can study the excavated sites of ancient Egyptian civilizations. If you want to study about the ancient Greece, you can read the works of Thales, Heraclitus, maybe Socrates, Plato, Aristotle and so on. But the ancient Greek culture no longer exists. The ancient Egyptian culture no longer exists. Babylon, of course, you know what is happening in Iraq today. That's a, that's a place where Babylonian civilization emerged and flourished for years, or Assyria, or any of the ancient civilizations. But in India, the ancient civilization, the Vedic civilization, continues to flourish and continues to be relevant, continues to be admired, and not really that, it is expanding. That is something which no ancient civilization can never boast of. Why? The mystery is not far to seek. See, whatever you hold fast to, that you become. It's a great statement attributed Locke, who was not a spiritual man, he was practically an empiricist. Whatever you think you are, that you become. Now, whatever a civilization clings fast to, decides its destiny, its life. In ancient India, we made a choice. I'm here echoing Swamiji's statement. We made a choice long back. What should we choose as our ideal? The matter of the spirit. We made a choice. We chose the spirit as the ideal, spirituality. So spirituality constitutes the very genius, the very essence, the pivotal factor in, in the evolution of India's spiritual tradition. India's civilization and culture. And Atman. So Atman is eternal. Atman is universal. Spirituality is universal. Maybe not religion. Because by religion we mean a kind of man-made structure confined within the four walls of a belief in a creator God, a set of rituals, a holy book, and a place of worship. These are the four uh, pillars which constitute what we normally call formalistic religion. But spirituality goes far beyond that. And so it goes to Swamiji's credit that Swamiji made a line of demarcation between religion on the one hand and spirituality on the other. Spirituality is universal. It is related to the innate human experience of oneness of existence. As we realize 
the presence of the Supreme Spirit within us, we become calm and quiet. We enjoy internal harmony and peace. At the same time, we also be become better human beings. We become more broad-minded. We open the doors, psychological, mental doors and windows the outside world. We can look upon the whole humanity as one spiritual family. So, along with the realization of the immanent reality within, we also realize that the same reality is the omnipresent, transcendental, all-pervading reality. On the one hand, we enjoy peace within, harmony within, integrity within. Along with that, we also are able to look upon the whole humanity with broad-mindedness, compassion, and a Catholic attitude. So that is a special characteristic of spirituality. Now, coming to this point again, Swamiji said, if the ancient sages who have lived maybe 5,000 BC, 7,000 years back, if they return to India today, by today Swamiji meant in January 1897, if they return to India today, they won't find that this is strange land. They won't be bewildered. These are the two sentences which Swamiji made. What does it mean? If the ancient Ramses the second, the pharaoh who lived in 3000 BC, if he returned to Egypt, he won't recognize this ancient land. If Xenophon or Plato or Socrates or Thales returned to Greece today. Thales lived in 7th century BC. He was the first among the recorded Greek philosophers. If he returned to Greece today, certainly he won't recognize this ancient land. That Greece had vanished long back from the face of earth. When Swamiji says, Manu returned to today India, he won't find himself in a strange land, he won't be bewildered. Just a, Manu was an ancient lawgiver. Now, what is the secret of India's uniqueness? As I said, antiquity and continuity. As I said earlier, India made a choice long back. The choice was this. What is eternal, what is universal, what is everlasting? That, did, that became, and that continues to be, India's national idea, whether we recognize that or not. <coughs> now, Swamiji's special role was, this ancient Vedic tradition, which uh, flourished through a succession of teachers, acharyas and gurus, right from the Vedic times, through the long lineage, spiritual lineage of Rama, Krishna, Buddha, Shankara, and Sri Ramakrishna Paramahansa, Swamiji's own guru. And it culminates in Swami Vivekananda. So this ancient spiritual tradition was interpreted by Swamiji in the language of modern science, technology, reason, and also some of the unique characteristics of modern thinking. In fact, modern man, or women for the matter, is not willing to accept what she or he is told to accept. That's the uniqueness. In fact, that was the challenge which the established religions were encountering, facing in the, uh, in the later half of 19th century, right from the publication of Darwin's Origin of the Species, right from the publication of the Astapitra and Communist Manifesto by Marx and Engels, and right from the new discoveries of science and technology, and also with the emergence of a new school of thought in Western world called positivism. They all challenged the uniqueness claims of organized religions. The core created this world in six days and took the rest on the seventh day. Then he started supervising his creation and he threatens the non-believers with hellfire and he promises the reward of heaven to the believers. This is something which modern scientists, positivists, communist, radical humanists, and also evolutionists were not willing to accept. And Swamiji 
gave a new definition to religion. He said, religion is not a set of rituals, dogmas and doctrines. Religion is spirituality. And spirituality is built upon the fundamental principle of our individual experience. Experience of the presence of the supreme reality within us. And then we start feeling the presence of the Lord, God, within the whole creation. And we also feel the presence of the whole creation in God. Seeing God in all of us and seeing the whole creation in God. These are the two characteristics of spirituality as different and distinct from religion. Right from that time onwards, today you find there is a turning point. It continues. Swamiji's ideas of universalism, universal spiritual humanism, Swamiji's ideas of involution, which in a way uh, synthesizes the scientific aspect of evolution, theory of evolution and some of the few acceptable ingredients of the old uh, theory of creationism. And then modern ideas about the unity of existence, the modern dialogical approach in interfaith religions, interfaith dialogues, the idea that science and religion can coexist, they need not be at each other's throats, that true faith need not be opposed to reason, and science, true faith rather goes, and be, goes beyond and transcends reason. All these ideas which other religious traditions, other than Hindu religious traditions, are now slowly accepting. All these mark different levels of what happened uh, after Swamiji's passing away. So Habinger, you know, Habinger is, it implies uh, something which foreshadows foreign, what happens later, the, I mean, these are, all these ideas are included in Habinger. Every prophet, in, in a way, is a product of his past. His actions and interpretations, his teachings may be influenced by his present. But he's a prophet because he gives something precious, to the future humanity. And what Swamiji gave was this unique idea of religion interpreted as spirituality, religion interpreted as universal spiritual humanism, religion interpreted as realization of divinity already in man, as Swamiji said, which means it is spirituality. Religion which goes beyond rituals, beyond doctrines, beyond even philosophical systems, beyond mythologies, which ultimately implies the experience of unity of creation. This idea, directly or indirectly, influenced uh, intellectuals, thinkers, philosophers, and others in innumerable uh, levels, I could say. When Swamiji came to America, there were two or three movements in this country who had some understanding of oriental values. The transcendentalists, the theosophists, the universalists and the unitarians, who were of course practically, they were brought together. Universalism was practically accepted as an integral philosophy of unitarian church, uh, who used to invite Swamiji for lectures in their different uh, churches all over this country, including the Auckland church, which is close to the place I'm coming from. Now, but these, uh, these movements had a very lopsided understanding of India spiritual tradition. In 1567, 50 Upanishads were translated by a group of Sanskrit scholars at the, uh, I mean, when they, uh, at, the, at, uh, at the encouragement of Dara Shikha, who was the, uh, the Mughal emperor at that time, and later, these, these 50 Upanishads were translated into Latin from Persian by uh, 
Dupirov in 1801. The first translation in 1567 took place and these 50 scholars translated these Upanishads from Sanskrit into Persian. From Persian they were translated into Latin by Dupirov, a great French savant. And later Hendrik and Dusen translated them, Dusen translated 60 Upanishads from um, Sanskrit into German, but Hendrik translated from Latin version into modern languages. Now, some of them got some ideas of the spiritual tradition of India by reading these translations. Schopenhauer, his name is to be mentioned in this context. He was the first great Western thinker to realize the true spiritual import of the Upanishadic tradition, who happened to read the Latin translation by Dupero. But they had a very partial understanding of what the spiritual tradition of India really implied. They got only an intellectual understanding of the Upanishadic tradition. And intellectual understanding is different from spiritual understanding. Because Swamiji was not just a professor of philosophy, Swamiji combined in his role both the, uh, both the professor and also a prophet. A prophet is different from a professor. Prophet uh, studied but also has realized the essence of what he has studied. A professor interprets at the academic level. Now, it happens to be that Swami Vivekananda was the first spiritual teacher who gave a spiritual interpretation of India's philosophical tradition. That's to be understood very, very clearly, spiritual interpretation. Because spirituality implies realization or experience. Academic understanding, academic teaching implies only uh, intellectual cognition and intellectual interpretation. When they listened to Swamiji, they found that Swamiji was speaking not just what he had studied, but also what he had experienced. That's why Sister Nivedita, while interpreting, while analyzing Swami Vivekananda's spiritual philosophy, says three important uh, factors constitute the symphony, the music of Vivekananda's philosophy and teachings. One, uh, the training, the spiritual training that he received uh, at his uh, guru's teacher's feet, Sri Ramakrishna Paramahamsa. For five years, Swamiji sat at his guru's feet. He practiced and he realized his first-hand experience of what he was teaching, what he was preaching about. Second, his Eastern and Western education. In fact, it is this factor which contributed to Swamiji's role as a bridge between the East and the West and also as the harbinger of India's spiritual tradition. Because Swamiji had studied, he had the first-hand knowledge of the theological, the philosophical, doctrinal aspects of India's spiritual tradition. And then he practiced under a great teacher who himself had the same experience and the experience was transmitted by the teacher to the disciple. And along with that, Swamiji also had a first-hand understanding, knowledge of the life of Indian society. In fact, that gave him a, a, a glimpse into the problems of, uh, of a society which forgets its material comforts, material life, and becomes obsessed with spirituality. When Swamiji traveled all over India, he was bewildered. He was, on the one hand, he became proud. On the other hand, he felt somewhat ashamed. He felt pity for this country. The nation which had produced the greatest philosophers, spiritual saints of the world, a nation which even produced great mathematicians and scientists like Aryabhatta, Bhaskara, Sangrama, innumerable medical scientists like Charaka, Susur and others. A nation which has produced so many uh, philosophers and spiritual sages. That nation, in his own words, steeped in poverty and divisiveness. A nation inhabited by people who are quarreling the name of 
uh, cults, groups, castes, and so on. Nation which is steeped in uh, socially divisive uh, injustices uh, like uh, burning of the widows, child marriage, neglect of the masses and the women folk, and the complete neglect of the material realities of life in this world, all in the name of a name of a, mis a misinterpreted concept of religion, which was again interpreted as just a, just a uh, set of rituals and mechanical practices. So Swamiji asked one question, addressing the Indian people. In fact, Swamiji's great contribution to Indian society was, he was the first prophet to point out the inadequacies, the drawbacks of Indian society. Pointing his finger in Indian society, Swamiji said, you have certainly produced a great spiritual culture, but you have gone wrong somewhere. As a society, India became poor, India was conquered again and again, India became divisive, people became superstitious, people became illiterate. And then, you know, he says, why was it that a handful of Europeans could come to this country and conquer the entire nation and the whole population lay prostrate before them. You can find this in, Swami, in the Colombo del Moro lectures. And he says, the answer is not far to seek. United we stand, divided we fall. So social unity, national unity are important for the country. And along with that, along with spirituality and religion, India also needed science, technology, the organizational skill, the efficiency, the work ethic, the punctuality, the leadership skills, the genius for coming together for a common cause, forgetting petty differences and quarrels, which Swamiji said Indians should learn from Western nations. So a synthesis of the best of the Oriental and best of the Occidental, the organizational genius, the leadership skills, the spirit of science and technology of the West should go hand in hand with the spiritual tradition of India. So in this sense we find Swamiji becomes not only a habinger, but also a connecting bridge between the best of the East and best of the West. Now after Swamiji you find a number of organizations and great individual teachers had come to the Western world. See, today in many parts of this country you find yoga studio big shops and advertisements in magazines and newspapers selling yoga mats and so on. This, is, this, was, this was made possible because of Vivekananda. Swamiji was not a Hatha Yogi. He was not uh, teaching people how to stand on their head. Swamiji was teaching people how to stand on their feet in fact. Put in a figurative way. At least that's what he taught Indian people. You should be able to stand on your feet. But these yogic practices would not have been possible but for Vivekananda. He taught yoga, of course, Padanjali Yoga Sutra. Uh, yoga is an integral, full fledged philosophy of spiritual life. That's what he taught. But as a part of it, yoga happened to be popular in this country. Or well, just think of interreligious dialogue. It's a, one of the important areas where Swamiji's contribution is very, very clearly strongly felt. Even the Vatican brought out a document along with the Ecumenical Council Papal Bull in which they stated that there could be grains of truth in other religions too. Most probably John II, 1960 to around that period. An important document became popular at least among the Jesuits of India. There could be grains of truth in other religions too. Now, today you find nowhere in the world an enlightened preacher would ever speak in terms of uh, exclusiveness of religion. People are willing, at least they are forced to accept that there are truths in other religious traditions also. There are three main streams in interfaith relationship. One is highly exclusivistic approach, which is very rarely found, at least not oftenly, in any interreligious encounters 
in today's world. Nobody will speak in terms of exclusivism today, no. Then there is another approach, syncretism. Those who adopt the exclusivistic approach would tell you that their religion is the only true religion. All other religions are wrong. Then the second approach is syncretic, where they believe that you give up all your religious traditions, you surrender everything and accept the oriental way. In fact, there are many, many zealots, oriental zealots, enthusiasts, they come to our Vedanta society and they, they criticize the Judeo-Christian tradition. So I never uh, encourage them, I discourage them, say there are great truths in Judaism, in Christianity, in Islam, in Buddhism, everywhere. Every religion contains in it the, the certain fundamental spiritual principles. In fact, that is one of the teachings of Sri Ramakrishna. Every religion contains in it some elements of spiritual truth. The ancient Vedic sutras you find Indram, Mitram, Varunam, Akni, Rahu, Adho, Divyasa, Suparno, Garutman, Ekam, Satvi, Praha, Dugudhavadanji, Agnim, Yamam, Matri, Shwanamahu. You find this in the Rigveda Samhita, the first mandala, it's the most ancient uh, religious work known to human civilization. All these are different parts which knowledgeable people, wise men and women, used to call the same reality, Ekam, Satvi. This idea, so, the idea that one should surrender all that one is born into, one's own religious tradition, and completely adopt or borrow another religious tradition, that attitude also is not correct. The third approach called dialogical approach. Every religion has something to teach and something to learn. In every religious tradition, in every spiritual tradition, there are second, se certain secondary factors. Geographical, linguistic, sociological, anthropological, and so on. Those factors are secondary details of a religious tradition. They, and at that level, there are differences and conflicts also among different religious traditions. But when you come to the primary factor, namely the spiritual principles, the fundamental universal spiritual principles, they all the, you find all the great, great prophets, all men of realization, spiritual realization, not philosophers, those who are raised at the experience level, they spoke of the same truth, of the same experience, but they used different languages. If you read the works of Meister Eckhart, the 13th century German mystic. If you don't know German, you can read the interpretations of Rudolf Otto, Otto, you find. Many of his statements are practically reproductions from Shankaracharya's Bhashya. The idea that the known, the knowledge and the uh, and, uh, knower merge into one, the language of experience is silence. The language of spiritual experience is silence, not verbosity. All these ideas you find in the heart, because he was a mystic. The difference is, in India's spiritual tradition, these mystics were recognized, they were worshipped as spiritual foreigners, had been girls of spiritual tradition. But in the, I mean, in the Europe, in, during the Middle Ages, some of them were given post-mortem recognition, they were canonized, they were proclaimed saints, but a good number of them were tortured, persecuted, or exterminated. Even Eckhart vanished practically, we don't know anything about him. So, Swamiji says, at the experience level, you find all religions are practically so many roads leading to the same destination, and that destination is innate spiritual experience. In fact, this contribution, Swami Vivekananda's interpretation of religion as experience which goes beyond rituals, mythology, doctrines, dogmas, even philosophical systems, this constitutes the foundational principle, a strong bedrock.
for all kinds of modern interreligious encounters and interreligious dialogues. Again, you look at the impact of Swami Vivekananda's words and ideas in Western world and also in India. He was a forerunner, he was a harbinger of so many things to come. Scientists like Nikola Tesla, psychologists like uh, Carl Jung, who had who quarreled with his teacher Freud and broke away from him. Great outstanding writers like William James, the, in his famous book, The Varieties of Religious Experience. In many of their writings, you find the influence of Swami Vivekananda. I should point out one factor in this context. Many of the great thinkers, psychologists, theologians, and writers did, at least indirectly, acknowledge Swami Vivekananda's contribution, their indebtedness to Swamiji's interpretation of religion as something universal, and also Swamiji's interpretation of the Sankhya philosophy and this doctrine of his uh, interpretation of involution, in which he said, every effect is nothing but a cause in another form. There is no such thing as creation at all. Creation is nothing but the manifestation from the subtle to the gross. And the manifestation, the, the creation will go back to its subtle form, which is called involution. So what is created, what manifests, is already involved within the effect. Just as a seed becomes a mighty banyan tree. Where does the tree come from? The tree doesn't come from the, from the earth. It doesn't come from the manure, the watering, for under the plant. That mighty tree is already involved, contained in the seed. The seed is subtle form. The tree is the gross form. So unless the manifested gross form already is contained within the seed, you can't expect the seed to evolve through evolution into this tree. These ideas are found in complete works. But you find American thinkers like uh, George Santayana, for example, naturalist, he didn't acknowledge it. Many Western thinkers have taken many of these ideas from Swamiji's complete works and then repackaged and made them part of their own philosophical vocabulary without acknowledging the indebtedness to Swami Vivekananda. Swamiji never claimed to be an original thinker. You have to remember this. In fact, that is the genius of India's spiritual tradition. In India's spiritual tradition, Every prophet, every great teacher says that he is just giving a new interpretation to our ancient Sanatana Dharma. Sanatana Dharma means Sanatanam Karoti Di Sanatana. Sanatana means something which is eternal. It never was born any at, at any point of time. It doesn't originate in the past. So it will not vanish in future. It is eternal. That which comes into existence will vanish sometime in the past. Because birth is nothing but the transition from a state of non-existence into existence. Death is nothing but the transition from a state of existence into non-existence. So whatever comes into existence will vanish. But whatever is eternal is never born and therefore it never dies, it is eternal, it is everlasting, it is immortal. Now, Swamiji, if you read Swamiji's, uh, great, uh, one of these great uh, Madras, for one of the four Madras lectures, the Sages of India, you find Swamiji traces the origin of India's spiritual tradition to the Vedic times. The ancient rishis, they also did not produce this truth, they realized. They realized this truth. In fact, he himself says, you know, he compares how a sage realizes eternal spiritual truths with how a scientist discovers, not invents, but discovers a great spirit, a great scientific truth. Theory of gravitation was already there long before Newton was born. Newton's only job was to discover it. 
he did not invent it. Similarly, these eternal spiritual truths have been there all the time. When we turn our mind inward, when, our, when we turn our investigation inward, we realize these truths. Through introspection, we realize these truths. We think the scientist turns his attention outward and through intense concentration and meditation on the mysteries of nature, the nature itself is forced to reveal its secrets, which we call discoveries. A saint also is a scientist. In fact, this synthesis of the scientific and spiritual is another important contribution of Swami Vivekananda. Spirituality is not opposed to science. It is as scientific as science itself. Formerly, there was a long conflict going on in the Western world between faith, theology, religion on the one hand, reason, science, technology on the other. There was, there was always a conflict between the, authority, the theological authorities and the great scientific discoveries. You know what happened to Copernicus and Galileo, I need not describe. Now, in India, on the other hand, the great scientist like Aryabhata is considered to be an Acharya, Bhaskar Acharya, he is a mathematician, physicist. Charyaka Sushuda, all these, they were Ashtanga Hridaya and all these are Ayurvedic texts, they were considered to be Acharya. So in India, even a great scientist who turned the enquiry to external nature through introspection, who discover, who force nature to reveal its secrets, were recognized as Acharyas. In Western world, scientists who discovered the truths of nature were condemned and persecuted. And Swamiji says, Spirit, true spirituality, that is true religion, is as scientific, as rational as science itself. There is an ancient verse in the Rigveda Samhita, the 10th Mandala, it's called Nasadiya Sutta. In English, you may find the, the hymn of creation. It begins like Nasadasi, Nasadasi, like that's how it begins. But there's an interesting uh, part in the middle. Sato Bandhum Asadi Niravindan Kriti Pradeshya Kavayo Manisha. This is the verse. Sataha Bandhum means Sataha Bandhum means Asya Jagadha Karanam, means the ultimate cause of this universe. The ancient sages went in search of the final cause of the universe. And they investigated everywhere outside. But they couldn't recognize. And then what happened? They turned their inquiry inward. When they turned their inquiry inward through introspection and meditation, they realized that what they were seeking really existed within their own self. It was their own inner self, the immanent reality. So, Kriti Pradeshya, Kriti Mi Kriya Gukhayam, Kavayom Kavayaham Indusayaha, Manisha means uh, Buddhya, means pure intellect. When their mind became pure, they turned their inquiry inward and they discovered the final cause of the universe within themselves. So if you turn the inquiry inward, you become a saint, a rishi. You become a spiritual personality. You realize the supreme truth, what we call you the mystic. All the great mystics of the world, St. Francis of Assisi, Reichard, Jesus, Buddha, Krishna, Rama, Shankara, Sri Ramakrishna, all these great saints, they all turned their inquiry inward. Of course, the way they must have turned their inquiry inward may be different depending upon the cultural, geographical, anthropological, sociological factors, because they always, these factors influence the way a prophet or a spiritual person interprets his or her experiences. Because in many cultures, uh, some of these words, the vocabulary doesn't exist. Depending upon that, there could be complications. But when you realize the supreme truth, you find that reality is within you. It is also the all-pervading reality. It is also the transcendental reality. Now, Swamiji gave this 
radical revolutionary idea of the Western world. When I use the radical revolutionary, you have to remember, Swamiji, Swamiji said again and again, I have preached nothing but the Upanishads. After teaching, after these long campaigns of Vedantic preaching all over the world, Swamiji said finally, I preach nothing but the Upanishads, the eternal Vedic Sanatana Dharma. In the Munduga Upanishad, there is a there is a famous verse. It graphically describes how differences and distinctions at the ritualistic and theological, doctrinal, philosophical level completely vanish when you reach the experience. This is, this is a mantra from Munduga Upanishad. The tradition it belongs to Atharveda tradition. The mantra actually occurs in Rigveda Samhita, it's the most ancient book. Now, the verse says this rivers, streams, and brooks, they all empty their waters into the ocean. When once they re merge with the ocean, the differences vanish. See, Brahm Brahmaputra and Ganga both empty their waters in the Bay of Bengal. Once they join the Bay of Bengal, it's an ocean for the matter. The differences vanish. Differences exist only at the level of means, tools, the paths. When you reach the destination, differences vanish. And the destination of ex is experience. Now, I can just draw your attention. Today, Today's world in 21st century, there are many outstanding humanists, great philanthropists who, who believe in reason, who admire Gandhi, Martin Luther King, uh, who, who are great heroes of mankind, great humanists, but they are agnostics or atheists. See, the great, maybe Cambridge scientist. Called uh, uh, Richard Dawkins, many, even recently there was a great uh, radical agnostic in America, Christopher Hitchens, who passed away. Now these great men, great in their own way, mind you, they did not believe in, in the transcendental authority of a creator God. They, they, were, they, they were highly critical of all types of organized religions, priestcraft, everything. But they welcomed any idea which teaches mankind to look at others with compassion, broad mindedness. Any kind of any any prophet or any teacher who spoke of nonviolence, pacifism, and and certain teachings which will be useful for whole mankind. They deny God. They don't accept God. But they are willing to accept certain fundamental humanistic teachings. Now, humanism at the scientific level, at the communist or social material level, is always lopsided. Now, humanism at the spiritual level is universal. Because spiritual humanism is built on the principle that humanity is one, creation is one. The entire humanity is one spiritual family. So, you can't hurt others without hurting yourself. Not because you are afraid of God. Because by hurting yourself, hurting others, you are hurting yourself. There are many people who tell you, well, I don't believe in God. Now, what kind of ethical philosophy will you present before such people? They are not afraid of going to hell. They are welcome going to hell, all right. They won't, they won't mind going to hell. If by denying God's existence, they are destined to go, go to hell, they won't mind. You can tell them, you see, look here. Ethics is not based on the fear of God. Ethics is based on the fact of the unity of existence. You may or may not accept God. Buddha did not accept God. He did not deny it. He was an agnostic, not an atheist, as many people try to uh, interpret him. Buddha, perhaps one of the greatest humanists the world has produced. Just like any of our rishis were like. 
and he was an agnostic. One of the greatest spiritual personalities. So spirituality goes beyond religion. Spirituality opens doors and windows, even to non-believers. It's because so universal. Because it's based upon the fact that the entire humanity is one spiritual family. Now, the genesis of this idea which Swamiji gave the world can be found in Mandukya Upanishads. So Siddhanta Vivasthasu Dvaitino Nishchida Dridham Parasparam Viruddhindi Taihi Ayam Na Viruddhidi. Kudavada is a, it's a commentary in verse, in metrical form, uh, which runs in 215 verses on the Mandukya Upanishad, which has only 12 mantras, 12 verses. Gaudapada says, so Siddhanta Vivasthasu Dvaitino Nishchida Dridham. People who are, who believe in distinction differences between God and man, man and man, and man and women, and world and God, who always think in terms of dualism, in terms of differences. They fight among themselves. My path is right, yours is wrong. Then Gaudapada says, this Advaita philosophy doesn't have any quarrel. Because Advaita philosophy looks upon the whole creation as one. You cannot fight with yourself. If you hit your left hand with your right hand, you, you are going to feel the pain. But that's what Bhashyakara Shankaracharya says. Asmadiyoyam vaidigo dharma na virudhyate. Parasparam anyon na virudhyate. He gives the reason, Atma ananyatva. Atma is one, not ananyam, it's not different. Atman, the Supreme Consciousness is one. And it is immanent in all beings, Ishara Sarvabhudanam, Hridesi Arjuna Krishna. Gita also, 18th chapter, you find. The Lord is the perpetual resident in all, in the entire, in all beings. And that reality is also omnipresent. So, uh, you cannot, and this, Yadha Sukhastha Pada Dhivishankara Chari says, you cannot fight with your own hands and feet. You will feel the pain. Similarly, the whole humanity is one. This idea of universal spiritual humanism was Swami Vivekananda's reinterpretation of all that is precious, spiritual and universal in the Vedic literature, the Gita and Upanishads. And its impact can be found in the teachings of great organizations and teachers who have come to Western world, whether it's in my mission, whether the Divine Life Society, utter, there are innumerable organizations, teachers, they all come to the Western world, directly or indirectly, they are trying to follow the path which Swami Vivekananda opened, the Royal Highway which he opened in 1893. Some, most of them acknowledge, some of them do not. Again, in Western world, whether to, if you, if you talk, read about Toy Envy, Durant, if you read the perennial philosophy, it's nothing but an interpretation of some of the Vedanta's ideas. If you, believe, if you read the varieties of religious experience, why? I can give an example. Mary Baker Eddy's first original book, that's the Bible of Christian Science Movement. It contains innumerable references to Gita and Upanishad, first edition. Second edition, they were completely removed. So there are many teachers and thinkers who acknowledge and there are many who do not acknowledge. Hermann uh, Hesse, he, he was a German, he was the author of Siddhartha. He, uh, um, in fact, he remembered the name of Roman Rolla uh, when he wrote the book, at the beginning you find the the statement. And Roman Rolla was one of those few great Western science who were influenced by Swami Vivekananda. And that, uh, in fact, in the same category, you find Toy and B, Julian Huxley, Will Durand, and several other thinkers and philosophers who acknowledge Swami Vivekananda's view. 
So, the broadening of our outlook in the religious time. A new approach which synthesizes religion, theology on the one hand and spirituality on the other. A new synthesis of the East and West. And along with that, the idea that life is one, the line of demarcation between the secular and spiritual is only an artificial imaginary one. Our goal should be spirit to spiritualize the whole life so that secular merges with the spiritual. All these ideas are direct contributions to Swami Vivekananda. And his, as his stature grows higher and higher, he, the relevance of his ideas is more and more strongly felt and getting recognized. As the world goes on, you find Swamiji's ideas find more and more followers, admirers, and also great spiritual seekers who are eager to learn from a tradition which is more ancient than Babylon and Assyria and which is much more modern than our own times because in, in, in Swamiji's interpretation you find not only an ancient wisdom but also a most modern scientific rational approach towards the problems of our life. So I am much obliged to all of you to come here to listen to this talk and also to this institution for having invited me to come and give this lecture and share some of my ideas with you all. Thank you. Namaskar. devotees, friends, it was an excellent lecture that we were hearing, the harbinger of spiritual India, the spirituality that was explained what is spirituality and how that was introduced over here in the western world through a different means, Swami Vivekananda just nicely he was explaining and again and again going back to the source that is Veda, the Upanishads, Gita, quoting from there. This is the speciality of Shami Vivekananda. This is nothing, only 150 years is birth. The slowly, slowly whole world will understand the more you grow in civilization, more will understand that what philosophy Swamiji has given. Without philosophy, humanity cannot make any progress. All the actions that we take is nothing but the thought and the thought, profound thought and far-reaching effect that is philosophy Vivekananda has given. And not only over here, everywhere, in the science, in the spirituality, in even in the, in the poetry, everywhere. So I just remember, I just uh, thinking to tell you, the previously, our poets, they used to write in the Bengali, the water is dropping and the leaves are moving, jal pade pata nore. That was type of the poems that they used to write. The water is falling and the leaves are, they used to describing only the nature. After Vivekananda, suddenly the sleeping Leviathan, as Vivekananda was very fond of telling, woke up. And these poets, they started telling, writing in their poetry, Ore tora ota ji, agun lege che kotha, kar shankho uthi ache baji, jagate jagot jane. This is a famous Rabindranath. You realize, there's a fire, and someone is giving, blowing the conch, giving the call. So that way, the thought is changing call is given to the human soul and all the writers were also inspired so that with the human society changes every day every moment we are coming in close close but it will take time it's not a just a human life it's a society 
is not within one hundred years it will be completed. It may take thousands of years. Bhagavan, Buddha, Jesus, Krishna, this is two thousand years. Even then we have not understood the Jesus. So it is so nice that he came and slowly, slowly a wonderful picture is coming forward and the first Swami advent of a yogi, that was how Vivekananda was coming. He was actually Shiva himself coming down, taking the take of a human form for the benefit of the humanity. Then the make, making of Swami Vivekananda, how that boy, the young boy, the slowly becoming Vivekananda, a dedicated one, is constantly burning on discrimination. Then the monk transformed to missionary. Monks are supposed to be constantly sitting in a corner, in the caves, in the forest, and meditating only for his own uh, salvation. Now he became a missionary. Instead of his own salvation, he was working for the salvation of others. And today, the harbinger of spiritual India. And finally, on 29th September, Swami Prasannatmananda will speak on contribution to humanity. Vivekananda's contribution to humanity. That will be the concluding, the September program. In October also, in many, through many programs, we'll be remembering Vivekananda. November, of course, the culmination. There's a huge program will be there, particularly on 8 and 9 at Hilton. You are all welcome. Many of you, I want to find them uh, registered. Is waiting to register or what? So register yourself and then <coughs> we can understand how many people are coming, etc. that way. The more we come in close with the thoughts of Swami Vivekan, the more we are benefited. And sometimes some Swami, one or two sentences that will transform the whole, your life. We do not know. So that way only it changes. Something, it's not the, all the whole lecture will in, inspire you, may or may not. Not all the Swami's words, but maybe one or two words will help you. So please come and join us. And this month in, there will be uh, a free, of course, uh, that is retreat uh, at Ganges. This is also on Swami Vivekananda, particularly how he is teaching us to realize God through different parts. That will be in Ganges, but only two days, 27th and 28th. That is Friday evening and Saturday whole day. Sunday morning, we'll all come and join over here. Shami Prabhupada's lecture will be there. So that way, September. From October again, we will go back to normal routine. This is for the September. Thank you very much for coming over here. And if you have not got the flares or the in, uh, informations, please visit our website. You will get everything. Let us all join to offer our pronoun to Swamiji. Paru Tattve Sadalino Rama Krishna Samagaya Yodharma Sthapanarato Biresham Tam Namamyaham Biresham Tam Namamyaham. This last word is Birisha. Bira <coughs> means hero. And Isha means God. He is God among the heroes. And who is the hero? He who lives for others, sacrifices for others. So we have to follow Shami Vivekananda. We have to get inspiration from Shami Vivekananda. And our human life will be blessed by his. Thank you very much. Uh, today we will have the prashad after going up from down from here.